What this is, this is a presentation given on behalf of Scottish Resources Group, the Open Cast Coal Company in Scotland, concerning the um, fatal accident that they had way back in 2007. One of the reasons that we're doing it as the, as the um, inspector on their behalf, we're not giving it all on their behalf, but it was simply too onerous a task for the managing director of SRG to go around giving this um, presentation all around the country. And the presentation was drawn up as a result of recommendations made by the sheriff in the fatal accident inquiry to publicise the, um, um, the case, the case study and the learning points arising from it. So that's basically what it is. So kick off. I'll just give you some background. This is actually, as I say, this is Scottish Resources presentation. And although I've given it once or twice before, I don't know whether you've found this before anybody gives presentations. If you give somebody else's, it doesn't always come out quite right. So I'll apologise for that up front. But uh, to give you some idea of who and what Scottish Resources are. They're the largest surface mining company in the UK, which may come as a surprise to some, and they're producing 3.5 million tonnes a year. That's coal, by the way. Um, I mean, I've said this to people before. If you want to learn how to do muck shifting, go and talk to the Opencast boys, because they've got a pay mineral to overburden ratio, anything between 10 and 20 to 1. So they're going to be producing, you, if you could say, on an average, you'd probably multiply that by about between 12 and 15, to get an average of how much muck they move in order to recover three and a half million tonnes. That gives you an idea of how much they're shifting. They've got nine production sites, 900 employees, and that's their plant fleet, 29 prime mover excavators, and th this is big excavators. By prime movers, we're talking O and K RH120s, that sort of size. 122 dump trucks and 172 other main plant items. Dump trucks, when they talk about dump trucks, we're talking about 100 tonne dump trucks. We're not talking about uh, 50 and 60 tonne machines. Um, and other interests of the company have in land and renewable energy. This is a, a map, you can see that's roughly sort of the central belt of Scotland. Penny Venny Open Cast is down here. That's where the accident took place. And it's just, it's interesting from a geological point of view because you can see, clearly see the coal seams running through the central belt of Scotland there. The site itself is in Dalmellington, East Ayrshire. Operations commenced in 1987. It's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation producing 700,000 tonnes of coal per year with 130 employees. Now, they've given me a plant list here, but it doesn't actually specify how many TR100s or 777Ds there are. But there are a significant number, because it'd have to be to be fed by six RH120s. There are a significant number of uh, large plants on site. <laughs> now, on the 26th of February 2007 at 1 p.m., Two employees, foreman fitter and a fitter, were killed, crushed to death, when the Land Rover they were driving was run over by a Terex TR100 in the dig area. I should add that it's taken this long to come um, to be made public simply because it took until 2011, late 2011, for the... Um, for the um, civil cases to be settled. So it was only when they were settled that we were able to produce these, uh, this presentation to uh, roll it out. Right, what happened? The fitters were clearing a loading zone for non-critical inspection on the RH120. That is important, the non-critical, because actually they didn't have to do what they need. I don't know what the inspection was, but they basically decided to do it because they happened to be passing the machine at the time. The fitters didn't have a radio, they were using hand signals. The Land Rover drove past the stationary dump trucks, there were two of them, on their offside. There's some photographs and videos and things so you'll be able to see exactly what happened in a minute. The Land Rover parked in the Terex TR100's blind zone. Now you might think, with the way we deal with all-round <coughs> visibility today, that there wouldn't be a blind zone on a, on a machine like a TR100 or even a Cat 777. We'll look at that a bit more in a minute. The Terex TR100 
took off from stationary on full right lock. The operator felt a restriction in movement, but he backed off and had another go at what, he th what he'd hit. So he didn't know what it was, trying to drive over the obstacle. The obstacle, unfortunately, was a Land Rover with two people in it. Sorry, I forgot to move that on. Right, there's a plan of, of where we are. This is the, uh, that's the machine, one of the machines that was parked up. Here's the machine that moved forward on full right lock. That's where the Land Rover was. This is two other machines. That's machine moved from there to there, and there was another machine parked there. RH120 was up on the top of the dig. He was called down so that the fitters could have a look because they wouldn't obviously do any work up there. So that's, that's the, uh, the lie of the land. This is a photograph taken sh shortly after the accident. We make no apologies for showing these photographs. There are still two bodies in that machine. And that's what it looks like. A lot of people have a tendency to think, and, and, and even we, d we have a tendency to believe this, when the machine strike something like that, it'll either push it forwards or it'll rise up so high that you'll know that you've hit something. Well, of course, that's not what happens at all. The thing's just so heavy, it just goes straight through it, which is what's happened there. The machine is unladen, by the way. It's not a laden machine. There's another photograph showing what happens to a Land Rover with a TR100 parked on its roof. The hawser are on there was put in place because they tried to lift the front of the machine up using the excavator. Um, unfortunately, that had to be abandoned. They couldn't do it. It was also plainly obvious that the two occupants of the Land Rover were already dead. Following the accident, emergency procedures on site were instigated. I've already said that preparations to move the truck were abandoned be simply because they, A, they couldn't lift it, and B, it was obvious that it was too late anyway. The emergency services were on site within 20 minutes. There was a police investigation. Scottish Cold took a, um, undertook a detailed survey of the area. The bodies were finally recovered at 10 p.m. that evening. Obviously, HSE were informed, the investigations began, uh, and Scottish Coal undertook a full reconstruction of the incident, along with ourselves. Significant factors considered. The Land Rovers entered the dig area before the trucks were removed. And the supervisors were not made aware. There was no radio communication and the Land Rover parked in the blind spot of the TR100. Again, we'll come back to that in a minute. It is believed the truck driver wasn't concentrating and was actually reading a newspaper. That basically, while he was stationary, he was reading a newspaper and wasn't taking any notice of the things that were going on around him. And certainly the uh, sheriff brought that up as a significant factor. The truck moved away into its own blind spot on full right lock. Had the machine moved forwards before it turned right, obviously it would have been moving into an area where the operator could see it was clear before he moved. Whereas what he actually did was moved off on full right lock. Again, we'll see all that in a minute. Well, we will if it works. <laughs> um, on full right, right lock and moved into his own blind spot. The Land Rover and the truck are actually the same colour, so there was no contrast between them that would have alerted the driver to the existence of the Land Rover. And the truck driver was fully trained, but he was relatively inexperienced. I think he was three months on the job. So he had all of his tickets, NVQs, etc., but he was relatively inexperienced. There we have a photograph of, of a Land Rover parked in the same position as the one that was struck, showing proximity to the TR100. And from that photograph, you might think that the operator would have absolutely no trouble seeing that Land Rover at all. However, oh sorry, there is just one more photograph. That just shows the tracking of the, uh, of the TR100 as it moved off. However, if we look at this from the operator's point of view, 
you can see there is the roof of the Land Rover. Just that little bit there. There's no way that the operator could see that from where he was sitting, even with his additional mirrors. When the machine was fitted with all of the additional visibility devices which we would have expected it to be fitted with. Just as a bit of, um, that, that's what gave the uh, evidence of the possibility that the driver was reading a newspaper simply because it, it was there and it was on the seat. So he clearly turned, put it on the seat as he got out the truck. Or thrown it onto the, 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 the seat, I should say, as he got out the truck. It's not conclusive that he was reading a newspaper. It's a reasonable explanation as to why he didn't see the Land Rover draw up. There's no proof at all. Right, first video. This, hopefully, will show... Um, excuse Dave Patterson's broad accent, but I hope you can get the gist of what he's saying. Video 66, taken by David Patterson on 01st March 2007, from the east side of the accident location. The video shows the best known movements and position of the vehicles prior to the accident. This information has been put together from witness statements and positional surveys done after the accident. The RH120E excavator is working on a bench on the east side, driven by Duncan McDougall. CAT Treble 7D is in the loading zone in the reverse position waiting on the excavator presenting his bucket for loading operations to begin, driven by Peter Murray. Terex TR100 is in the loading zone facing eastwards and awaiting the CAT Treble 7D reversing back to the excavator, driven by Alan Shannon. The Land Rover is seen approaching the loading zone from behind the offside of the Terex TR100 and signalling the excavator to come down from the bench. It is known that the Land Rover reversed slightly and then signalled the CAT Treble 7D to leave the loading zone. The Terex TI-100 has then decided to leave the loading zone as well, turning to his right and colliding with the stationary Land Rover. RH120E on bench, CAT Treble 7D in reverse position awaiting the excavator, Terex TI-100 facing eastwards in the loading zone. Land Rover can be seen approaching from the outside rear of Terex TI-100. Land Rover driver then signals to the excavator operator to come down off the bench. Land Rover has reversed slightly and signaled to CAT Treble 7D to leave the area. The excavator fails to come down off the bench. And at some stage, Terex TR100 has come to his right and okay. collided with the There's, the there's, the there's two more left. videos to go with this. Video 67, taken by David Patterson on 1st March 2007, from the Terex TR100 operator's driving position. The video shows a panoramic view of what the operator may have seen by direct sight or via mirrors during the lead-up to the collision. There could have been opportunities to see the Land Rover approaching the loading area on the haul road in the near side mirrors, or entering the loading zone on the truck's offside via mirrors or direct sight. It is known from the final collision positions that some of the Land Rover roof has likely been visible prior to reversing back. Video taken from Terex TR100 driving position. Panning to the offside through windscreen, looking at excavator and cart treble 7D through side window and door window to offside mirror position. 
now panning back to the left towards the near side now looking in near side mirrors Land Rover can be seen moving on Hall Road through the near side mirrors now Panning back to the right towards the off side of the truck Looking in off side mirrors, Land Rover passing by Gap Land Rover roof now being visible Land Rover driver makes signal to excavator operator to come off the bench is reversing back has now signalled the CAT 777D to leave the area and Land Rover remains in this area at some stage Terex TR100 driver decides to drive to his right colliding with the stationary Land Rover Video taken by David Patterson from the south side of the accident area. The video shows the Terex TR100 in position prior to the collision. The Land Rover's position is known by survey and marked by spray paint on the ground. The offside wheel track on full lock is also highlighted showing the impact position some 1 to 2 metres from the front of the Land Rover. Video 6 Terex TR100 in position with full lock offside wheel track highlighted. The non Land Rover position from surveys was also shown. Terex moving off from full lock. And colliding with the Land Rover. Still makes my blood curdle every time I see it. Right, system improvements. We'll come back to, to a bit more on visibility in a minute. They now have radios in all vehicles and traffic management plans have been reviewed with new rules controlling entry into the dig areas. The supervisors now have vantage points whereby they can see across the whole of the operating, operating area. They don't have to go down into the dig area. Full segregation of light vehicles with separate routes. And another issue which you've probably heard of coming through your own company is buggy whips on all light vehicles. Offside CCTV on all rigid dump trucks, but there's been another development on that which I'll also talk to you about a bit later. Improvements to the TR100 operator visibility and additional training with MPQ assessors and instructors. Let's have a look at the visibility. Here we have the truck, this is the improvements they've made before any improvements were made and you've basically got the fire extinguisher and the battery box making a significant contribution to that offside blind spot. There's no reason whatsoever for them to be there so they've moved them. Look at the difference it's made. It's striking. It certainly struck me because I don't know if you remember on that video how much of the Land Rover you actually saw going past the window it was virtually nothing. There's a lot more there which would have caught, well could have caught the eye of the operator. Doesn't solve the problem but it makes things a lot better. They've also fitted an additional offside monitor. And again, I'll come back to some more developments since then. This is the trucks as they are now, not what they're trialling. You may have seen what they're trialling at Hillhead. You've got the rear view camera monitor and the offside camera monitor. You'll also notice that they've been carefully positioned so that they're not in a blind spot. They're actually, um, the bonnet of the machine is behind them so they don't contribute to any blind spots. Now let's have a look at a uh, visibility assessment of the vehicle. This is the vehicle with no visibility aids. The yellow area is what the driver can see from the cab. If we look at the mirrors and nothing else, 
This is what he can see from his mirrors in the yellow area again. This is what he can see with his convex mir mirrors, additional convex mirrors. This is what he can see with his cameras. And this is what happens when you combine the lot. Guess where the Land Rover was? So even with all of that lot on, there is a significant blind spot dust there. At the time, the machine did not have the offside camera fitted to it. So that section was actually a lot bigger. It actually got, extends around there. So there was no way he was going to see that at all in the position it was in. Right, this, this now is what the equipment has fitted, to, what, what it has um, on it now. As you can see, all the mirrors are numbered. Um, and they're all numbered consistently as well, so that if an operator can report, say, damage to mirror number six, mirror number six will be held in, uh, in stock, mirror number six can be fitted. So he, he only needs to radio to say, I don't know, mirror number six might have had a stone hit it and it's cracked, needs repairing. When it comes up for, um, for break time, the fitters can straight away, they can go, they've got mirror number six, swap it straight over, it's a dead easy job. Exactly the same situation on the uh, cat machines. Again, consistently numbered mirrors um, and the two cameras fitted. They've also introduced what we said before, the light vehicle segregation. Here you've got the uh, standard three and a half times width carriageway with a bund and then a separate carriageway for light vehicles. Now, we accept and everybody accepts that not everybody is going to be able to create a situation where they can uh, segregate light vehicles in that manner. What this is suggesting is where it is practicable to do so, it's a very, very good idea for all the reasons that we've mentioned. So where there is room to do it, we ought to be doing it. Where there isn't, we need to have more robust traffic management systems in place, even to the point where if it's a practical um, proposition to stand up the large vehicles while the small vehicles move around them. And once they're clear of the area, the large vehicles start up again. All sorts of things that we can do. This is the view from the, the supervisor's vantage point. And one thing that is extremely important when you introduce radios, and I think this is something which... Um, the traditional quarry side of the industry probably didn't have so much issue with, but I do know that the open cast um, did have one or two issues with this because they'd had trouble with people basically chatting and messing around on the radios. Um, you do need to have a robust radio protocol to ensure that the radios are only used for the correct reasons. And another thing that's extremely important is to make sure that each machine on site is easily identifiable and the operator knows what machine it is he's driving, because they may not drive the same machine every day. In this case, it's perfectly clear that if we radio this or put a call out over the radio for machine number 35, everybody knows what machine number 35 is. The operator knows, everybody around him knows, and then we'll be prepared that this machine may well stop because it's been called up on the radio. Now, the consequences for Scottish Resources Group. Two prohibition notices, one for no entry of non-production vehicles into the dig area, and one for non-use of dump trucks without radios. A prosecution under sections 3 and 33 of the Health and Safety at Work Act, they were fined a total of £400,000 with full costs. A fatal accident inquiry, which took 35 days in court. The civil claims, which have now been um, settled. The substantial production management and legal costs, and of course, consequence, loss of reputation. Now, Scottish Resources haven't disclosed how much the non-insured or the, uh, the additional costs actually are, but I'm led to believe that they are into millions. So that accident cost them an awful lot of money, quite apart from the um, other impacts that it would have had to pay people on site. 
This is the sheriff's determinations. He said these th precautions could have been taken which may have prevented the deaths. There should have been radio communications. This is where the sheriff picked up the truck driver had paid attention and not been reading a newspaper. Now that is actually what the sheriff said, although there, as I said before, there, there is not, I don't think there is the evidence to say that he was reading it. There is evidence to say he could have been. If the truck had stopped after the initial collision, that may have been down to a little bit of experience. The truck driver possibly thought he just touched a boulder and just have another crack at it. Specific training and instruction to prevent full lock turn into a blind zone and when faced with an obstruction, that's what we talked just about moving into the area you can see on a large machine before you turn because that way you're always moving into an area which you know is clear. Buggy whips fitted to light vehicles. Important issue with buggy whips by the way is that wherever possible the flag should be positioned at the, site, the eyesight line of the driver, the largest vehicle on site. Fairly obvious, but that's where it should be. And in fact, the um, illustration earlier on shows it's slightly too high. Where are we? That one. That buggy whip's actually too long. So it's a little bit out of, um, out of scale. Right, other relevant factors. It talks about the failure to learn the lessons from the 2005 incidents. There was an incident at a Scottish Resources site in 2005 where um, a, a Land Rover was hit, but there were no injuries. So they said they basically failed to learn the, the, the lessons there. Greater emphasis was required to alert operators of the consequences of reading newspapers. Now, actually, moving away from the idea that... Uh, we all know we've got radios, etc., in cabs and machines. There's actually a lot to be said for the fact that people operating machines actually shouldn't be listening to radios because it's, it could be seen as distracting. Now, I know that we, the, the counter-argument is that it's boring as a job and it gives them something to occupy the brain, if you like, while they're just doing a fairly, um, what is effectively, a mundane, repetitive job. But... These people operating these large machines or any machines on site, the other argument is that you need your wits about you all the time. But then again, there is another counter-argument that says we all listen to the radio when we're driving our car up the motorway. So I'm not going to come down one side or the other on that one, but it is an interesting um, observation that somebody made. Um, it points to the fact that there were post-accident safety improvements that were introduced by Scottish Coal. We've gone through some of those. Scottish Coal has performed a leading role in promoting safety within the, in the industry, which it has. And in fact, the, uh, the, the previous managing director of Scottish Coal um, Resource, Scottish Resource Group, Andrew Foster, is now the chairman of Coal Pro's Health and Safety Committee. And he's actually done an awful lot of work in driving that forward. Um, collaboration with the HSE, Colbro and Quinjack is important to ensure safety improvements are implemented. That is all ongoing. And improvements required to training and operator competence assessment schemes industry-wide. I'm not sure that the sheriff would have been fully aware of exactly what we do do in terms of training operators. That was just an observation that was made. Right. Sorry, I've gone ahead of myself there. I went ahead of myself there as well, didn't I? I do apologise. These were uh, additional other factors. Uh, this was the HSE, consider mechanisms for more efficient dissemination of best practice identified by inspectors. Well, again, the sheriff would not have been aware of things like Quinjack and how Quinjack <coughs> operates. And I know from um, Mike's talk earlier on as well that the industry itself isn't as aware as we would like it to be on Quinjack. And that's our fault, uh, or Quinjack's fault, and there are plans afoot to address that. HSE should inquire about radio use and traffic management during inspections. We do, and we always have done. Those of you who have had ins been inspected by inspectors will know that traffic management has arisen from time to time. Consider updating the quarries regulations and ACOP to address issues, segregations, blind spot radios. That is a political issue, the regulations will not be updated. 
However, the ACOP and guidance, as I said to you this morning, is being updated. However, there is, no, there is a feeling that there isn't, it isn't necessary to point specifically to radios because the problem is the quarries regulations have to relate to all quarries and not just large open car sites. It may be that in a small operation with perhaps one bendy dump truck running from a face and a simple um, sand washing plant, something of that sort, that hand signals are perfectly adequate. So I don't think we should be going down the route of insisting on radios, but I do think what we should be perhaps asking more of is what does the quarry risk assessment say in terms of communications? How has it addressed communications on site? And I think perhaps if it hasn't, then perhaps we ought to be considering knocking on the door a bit harder. Well, yeah. Um, engage manufacturers to ensure ongoing improvements. Again, I can say that Colpro are very proactively involved, as are the Mineral Products Association, um, through their Safer by Design initiative. We're talking with manufacturers to try and persuade them as to how they can improve issues without having to rely on the um, international standards to tell them what they should and shouldn't be putting on machines. Effectively, encouraging them, if you like, to move more into risk-based design rather than just designing it to comply with the standards. Develop industry practice for off-site CCTV and consider development of international standards. Right, well, I'll mention it now. Did anybody see the all-round visibility demonstration that Scottish Resources put on at Hillhead? Uh, yeah, who, who did see it? Right, it's quite a few people that didn't. So the only reason I ask is, so, is, is that if you haven't seen it, I'll try and explain what it is, very, very simply. You may or may not know that some high-end car manufacturers now use a system of four cameras, one at the front, or sometimes they use two at the front, two in the mirrors, one at the rear, and they stitch together that um, image digitally to show it on a monitor to give the vehicle all-round visibility. That system has now been developed for the use on large dump trucks. And it's, I have to say, from my, from, from my perspective, I actually can't see anything wrong with it at all. And I do know that the operators that have tried the system think it's absolutely brilliant. And it's exactly the same. It uses two, down, or uses four downward facing fisheye lensed cameras with the image stitched together digitally and presented on the single monitor in the cab and it shows a bird's eye view looking down on the truck of, the, of visibility all around it and because of the way the image is designed it has what's called a pie dish bend to it you get fairly good um, definition close into the vehicle and although the definition falls off as you get further away from the vehicle you can still clearly identify if there are um, obstacles in the way and that includes bolts, boulders and stones. It's extremely good. Uh, the resolution is excellent and it shows it clearly. And the system as, as, uh, that I saw uh, demonstrated at Hill Head was a significant advance over the early system that I saw demonstrated in Scotland back in February. So this thing is marching forward at quite a rate and it isn't hideously expensive, although you might think it is on the face of it. It was about £3,500 per machine. But when you're paying somewhere in the region of £600 to £900,000 for a 100 ton dump truck, that's actually very, very small beer. Very small beer. And at the moment, these machines are being trialled with the addition of the convex mirrors. Whereas, of course, if it's shown that this is effective, we can take the convex mirrors off and that will get rid of a significant blind spot. Because, of course, the mirrors create their own blind spots. So we can actually get rid of them. It's not a substitute for direct visibility, and it isn't a, sub a substitute for spotting using the mirrors. Because the, the definition and the, um, the natural distortion of the image caused by the fisheye lens means you can't do that. But it isn't a great deal different from looking through a convex mirror. It shows you that there is an obstruction, and that's what the operator needs to know. I think they're excellent. Um, 
HSC to consider the use of police crash investigators. Well, we would if it was necessary anyway. That, that's, that would be an ongoing. Consider introduction of new rid or dangerous occurrence category for, for vehicle incidents. Well, that's not going to happen because Lofsted has already said that, that rid or's got to be simplified. So I can say that that, that is a non-starter. That's not going to happen. Just to give you a timetable of the events, so that you can see why things took so long to get sorted out. Uh, the accident happened at, uh, in February 2007. The charges were laid in July. Scottish Coal pleaded guilty and were fined in August of 08. The fatal accident inquiry didn't commence until August two years later. And that's down to the, uh, to the procurator. The fatal accident inquiry was completed in March 2011 on a total of 35 days in court. The sheriff's determination was published in, in June and the civil claim was finalised in October 2011, virtually a year ago. Uh, and, and since then we've been rolling out this um, presentation. Now, this, this is just a timetable of where the... the um, presentations being given but should we think that this sort of thing has been stopped and doesn't happen anywhere in the world in the USA in 2010 that happened and in South Africa in 2011 that happened so there are still problems with visibility from large mobile plants it is addressable and we have new systems uh, of doing it um, and I think that system can only get cheaper and I can also see that it will have um, implications as well for other, other vehicles, not just large dump trucks. So I think that's a case of watch this space, it's developing technology. Um, you may have already said, you might have even seen the thing on Spillard's um, stand because it was there, Vic Spillard had it, he had a van set with it set up on there. Um, but it is an exciting um, development as I say and uh, I th it can only come down in price and it can only get better as technology improves but really that's all I've got to say about it that that is the presentation as I said it talks about the uh, the issues it shows you that we still haven't solved the problem with all round visibility although this verti this camera business goes a lot further than the systems we've had in the past we've still got problems and we still need to be extremely careful mixing small vehicles with blooming great big heavy stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.